Hello, dear participants. In this course segment, I'll be talking about why riding your bike or walking is good for your health and the climate. Why transportation? Well, transport is not only one of the greatest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, but it's, only the, it's also the sector where emissions have been increasing over the last two decades or so. You can see this illustrated here for Europe, but it's the case in many world regions, along with economic development and population growth. Along with its many benefits for society, transport also has a range of negative effects on environment and health, which you can see illustrated here. In my talk, I'll be focusing on the contribution that cycling and walking can make to reducing physical inactivity, which is a big problem in many regions of the world. Initially, I'll very briefly summarize also the direct effects on climate change and air pollution. This Swiss study looked at four scenarios of investing into physical activity through walking and cycling to reduce CO2 emissions from transport. And as you can see, they came to the conclusion that up to 15% of motorized trip stages could be replaced by cycling or walking. While the direct effects on CO2 reductions seem to be rather modest, in fact, they're similar to other traditionally discussed measures, such as introducing a CO2 tax. Another European study has taken a more optimistic scenario of reaching one of the highest cycling shares in the world, namely that of Denmark, in the other European countries by 2015. And as you can see, they also found more substantial reduction potentials with regard to the goals in the transport sector. How about the contributions from such shifts to reducing air pollution? For example, the concentration of fine particles, which is re extremely relevant with regards to health effects. This study here looked at four scenarios for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the transport sector, and they also looked at the respective effects on air pollution. And as you can see in the red frame here on the right-hand side, the reduction on fine particles from the increased active travel scenario are in fact very comparable to that of the lower carbon emission vehicles scenario. And that is again a strategy that many countries are investing in as part of their climate mitigation strategies. How about the health effects of cycling and walking? The health benefits from being physically active are now very well demonstrated and more recently studies have in fact started to look specifically at the health effects of walking and cycling as one particular form of being physically active. I can only summarize the results here, but for example from this recent meta-analysis which is based on a very extensive body of evidence you can see that we can now say that regularly walking or cycling reduces your risk of premature mortality by 10%. A slightly higher dose of walking is of course needed due to the lower intensity to achieve those benefits. There is also convincing or at least initial evidence on a range of other benefits that you can see listed here. And some of those are in fact among the key drivers of healthcare costs in many countries of the world. When we promote cycling and walking for health, we often get asked, well, how about the negative effects from air pollution or road traffic crashes? To answer these questions, we have summarized a range of health impact assessment studies. And you can see the results summarized here and illustrated in the light gray bars. You can see that the benefits from physical activity through cycling and walking clearly outweigh the negative effects from road traffic crashes or air pollution. And in fact, we found a very high benefit risk ratio across these studies. Of course, there can be extreme scenarios where this can slightly differ. And that's why it's, of course, important to improve air pollution and road traffic safety in all cities to further increase health benefits for everyone from cycling and walking. This study took a different approach and it looked at the co-benefits from investing into environments that we know are good for promoting physical activity. And you can see those approaches listed here on the left-hand side of the table. And as you can see, the authors found not only one, but many, many co-benefits illustrated by the green boxes across a range of uh, result areas, including um, social benefits, benefits for climate and the environment, but also for safety, and not least also for the economy. So in fact, we are not only talking about a win-win, but a win-win, win-win-win situation here. 
with regards to quantifying the economic benefits from the health effects of cycling and walking, there are now different tools available that can help you to do such analyses. And one of those is the Health Economic Assessment Tool, or HEAT, which you can find online. So I think I showed that there's much to be gained from promoting walking and cycling as a climate mitigation strategy. But where do we stand on actually capitalizing on those co-benefits? As you know, traffic is composed differently in different cities across the world. Some, such as Ahmedabad here uh, in Western India, have high shares of walking and cycling, while others still rely mostly on private motorized transport, such as city, Sydney, Australia, or many cities in the United States. Public transport can be a good alternative in some places, and it includes also short bouts of walking, but often it is becoming more and more crowded. While on the other hand, pictures of cycling traffic jams are really rather the exception. So in most places, there is still good potential to promote more walking and in particular cycling. But on the other hand, it's also about preserving the high shares of walking and cycling that we still have in some places, particular, for example, in Asia. Along with economic development, those are coming, becoming increasingly under threat. So how's the policy arena looking at this topic? Well, on the one hand, the fourth and fifth assessment reports of the IPCC have increasingly been talking about these co-benefits from promoting walking and cycling as part of the transport mitigation strategies. But they also underline that quantifying the benefits is still challenging. On the other hand, I find it very encouraging that more and more policies from other sectors are starting to include goals on cycling and walking. For example, the Global Action Plan on Non-Communicable Diseases here is underlining the importance of supportive infrastructure for cycling and walking and urban planning approaches to achieve the global target of a 10% reduction of physical inactivity. And as my last example, you see here the just recently adopted first ever regional strategy on physical activity, which even goes a bit further. It calls for the reduction of car traffic along with increasing walking or cycling. And we hope that it can serve as an example for other world regions to go into a similar direction with their regional strategies. So in conclusion, I hope I could illustrate that the effects on climate and air pollution from investing into cycling and walking are often comparable to that of more traditionally discussed approaches in the transport sector. However, the health co-benefits are substantial and often not yet fully taken into account. And there's also increasing evidence of other co-benefits. Luckily, international policy frameworks are becoming more and more available as a basis to go further in this area but more investments are needed from all sectors and players to put those into practice on the ground. Thank you very much.